this this color combination ain't it but this is what i wear bleak dystopian an absolute nightmare to be honest with you but that's just the weather today and because the weather is so shit, obviously i had to come up with another useless project i've been wanting to do like a 17th century dutch outfit for like three years now but i always imagined it to be like the higher class and recently I realized like I have already half of the stuff that is needed to make the working class outfit. So like, I'm, I'm just gonna go for it, you know? I've been researching this for like two days. Oh, I got an email. Hi, so I feel like I didn't do a fantastic job of explaining the project, so let me try again. My main inspiration is this lady from the 1629 painting by Arendt Arendt, uh, also known as Cable. Because I had this particular image in mind, it was time to do some digging and try to break down this look. I already suspected some things based on my early 1600s outfits, but this one was regional and required some additional research. <laughs> Judging by the painting, I guess that the red sleeve fabric is probably the same fabric that shows under the lacing, and most likely also the same fabric that the skirt is made from. Off? This would suggest that it's one garment, most likely a kirtle with sleeves. We also have a seemingly green apron, and when you put the contrast up, up, you can see a collared garment, most likely a partlet. So this is all cool and all, but I was still missing some vital information, you know? Are the red sleeves over or under the black sleeves? What does the jacket look like underneath the partlet? How is it structured? What does the back of the partlet look like? Is she wearing boots or is it just thick stockings? Uh, first of all, I concluded that since Arendt lived and worked in Amsterdam, it is uh, in this very like likely that the painting depicts an Amsterdam scene and therefore Amsterdam fashion or like North Holland fashion. So naturally I looked at his other paintings and then I looked at other paintings depicting winter in Amsterdam and lo and behold I stumbled upon many more similar silhouettes, especially in paintings of Hendrik Averkamp from a similar period. And those silhouettes will always wear skirts that are slightly shorter, they had sleeves with over sleeves or under sleeves, sort of similar laced bodices or jackets, and a pretty wild hairstyle consisting of some unusual braids. And one item which stayed almost identical from painting to painting was a black partlet which seemed to be trimmed with fur. And usually it featured a big spot of gold at the bottom back, which I assumed was some sort of a button to attach it to the back. So the problem with researching obscure and old styles like this one is that it's mostly speculation. There are barely any original garments where you can learn what the construction was and you know working class styles weren't usually described in magazines and diaries of the time as high fashion was so I'm mostly making a lot of assumptions here based on the visual cues that I get and based on practicality overall here is what I came up with the base of the outfit is a shift ruffles of which you can spot at the wrist and gray or dark stockings. And at first I thought maybe it was some sort of boots or garters because the legs of those ladies were quite thick compared to the other ladies painted, but you can clearly see that the shoes are reaching just below the ankle. So they're just regular shoes. And then some sort of bam pad would be worn. And it's a silhouette that echoes the fardingales worn by the rich ladies at the time, but it's much softer and looks a bit 18th century, to be honest. I tried wearing my curl over just a bam pad, but it had a very distinct 1590s look to it, so I'm assuming an unknown number of wool or linen petticoats would also be worn underneath. And that is sort of confirmed by numerous painted details of ladies falling on their knees and exposing their buttocks. So then it gets a bit complicated. I'm mostly confused by the sleeves. If they were short over sleeves pinned over the jacket, sort of like mitts, I think that would show. And also, they would probably be made of different fabric than the kirtle, right? They wouldn't have the kirtle fabric just laying there for them to make over sleeves. But if they were just kirtle sleeves showing under the jacket sleeves, why would the jacket sleeves be so short? Perhaps so the jacket could be worn both in winter and during warmer months. But it's, it's 
It's still a bit odd, to be honest. It's far-fetched. <laughs> so according to my research, aka meticulously studied, zoomed in spots of paint, sleeves were worn both ways. So either separate sleeves were pinned onto the jacket sleeves or the jacket sleeves were elbow length and the kirtle sleeves showed underneath. So for me, it made no sense to make red sleeves for my red kirtle and then wear a black jacket over it and then to make another pair of matching red sleeves to wear over the jacket. So I decided it makes more sense that it's the red kirtle sleeves that are showing. But as I said, it's pure speculation. So back to the order of the garments. On top of the shift, the bum pads and the petticoats went the woolen kirtle. The kirtle I'm using was made for my 1590s outfit and I think it shows a bit to be honest. Like the torso is a bit too long and so is the skirt, but I just decided to roll with it, you know. Because the kirtle was sleeveless, I needed to make a pair of the tetra sleeves pinned on or tied to the curl. Then on top of that goes a black wool jacket, sometimes laced with decorative hooks or what looks like golden buttons. Again, the jacket's shape is pure speculation because you can't actually see it in the paintings. Because of the lacing, I assume the top is sort of open and the collar would probably be cut in a way to accentuate a ruff if such was worn. So this would also work well with the partlet that sort of covers the neckline because you have a kirtle there and it's exposed and um speaking of partlets on top of the jacket goes a fur lined partlet and now this is again pure speculation it might have been just trimmed with fur since fur was expensive but if the woman could afford it a fur lined partlet even if it was her uncle's rabbits i don't know could definitely keep her warm so and then the accessories so she's wearing an apron which is most likely linen a pair of gloves probably leather a linen cap and a funny hat which honestly screams Mr. Collins to me uh, for some reason and oh almost forgot she's also wearing a pair of detachable skates I'm not gonna lie I did find a pair of detachable wooden skates on a Polish ver version of eBay and I couldn't hesitate to spice up the look so I did buy them <laughs> for no reason because I'm not gonna skate on them okay I kind of forgot that Yesterday I've already made an apron because that was sort of a thing that I've already researched enough to do um, oh, Come on, so I basically observed that the apron that I made for like late 1590s is not that much different from the North Holland aprons, however it's just difficult to tell because all of the characters that I'm basing this outfit on, the quality of the picture is like 20p. But I did notice that they're heavily gathered in front and also that the sides of the apron are let loose. Like it, not 100% of the fabric is sewn into the uh, waistband. So that's what I did. That is what I did. I just hand sewed this yesterday, watching Hell's Angels for the first time, 1930. The drama though. Anyway, yeah, it's just, it's literally just like, it's almost a square. It's just a rectangle. I hand sewed the whole thing though. That's kind of impressive, isn't it? I impressed myself. <laughs> anyway, you just tie it in the waist. Like, aprons are not that complex. I'm probably gonna draw it, just so you know, but it's, it's quite simple, you know? So I'll just, I'll just leave it here. <laughs> I started with drafting the kirtle sleeves using the 1590s waistcoat that I made some years ago. Uh, they were made of two parts, the top part and the bottom part. And I remembered to make the sleeve cap slightly longer so it allows movement. Now this is a big deal because otherwise the detachable sleeve is going to either block you in some way or like slide down and it's gonna get nasty. Uh, which is not completely bad because it's still historically accurate so whatever you're aiming for. Also shout out to my kitty for uh, taking a pile of linen and dragging it across the, my room and biting my elbow in the process. <laughs> Several times. <laughs> no. I made a mock-up in linen because if it turned out okay I could already use it as a lining and save myself some time and because I was using sleeves I already made and knew they fit me the chances of it turning okay were quite high. Oh there I say. <laughs> Kitty, co ty robisz? I then tried on the sleeve and tested if I can move my arms freely and then I proceeded to cut it out from red wool. Now, I actually didn't have any leftover wool from my kirtle, but I managed to find one that was pretty close in shade. I also had to remember not to cut any seam allowance when copying the linen. Yeah. 
and I tried the sleeves on and they fit so I sewed the top and the bottom edges together while watching this honored with Marlene Dietrich which I give a 7 out of 10 she was glorious in it then a very special package arrived these are wild <laughs> Before moving on, I decided to make sure the sleeves fit the kirtle properly and to mark where to make little holes so I can attach the sleeves with a string. I had to put all the undergarments on first though, which took 54 years. Anyway, the sleeves worked, yay! the jacket I cheated a bit and I used the bodice of my snow white dress because it just seemed like a similar structure you know and I kept checking in with the reference photo to see how wide the lacing space has to be and I also tried making sure that the jacket armholes will fit the detachable sleeves And then I ripped apart half of the mock-up so I can use it to cut off the wool layer. The wool layer worked, so after small adjustments to the armholes, I sewed the two layers together, leaving the bottom open so I can flip it over. Uh, here's some stuff I bought. So the string is for lacing the jacket. The tape is for decorating the portlets. And the golden buttons are for the lacing as well. The jacket still needed a lot of hand sewing, so I did some of it on the train. And then I decided to sew during a call with a friend. And it kind of worked, like it's not a bad idea to sew while doing things, you know? I then tried the jacket on to see if the buttons work as lacing hooks and they worked and I was so excited until... <laughs> so I sewed the button back on and I tried it on again very carefully. And then during another call with another friend, I started working on a partlet. And again, I used the partlet I already had and I sort of improvised the back. I had a fake fur stole from Zara that I bought in a charity shop years ago. And after careful consideration, I decided to take it apart and line the partlet with it. Now disclaimer, even if you do cut the fur on the wrong side and like separate the hair and are very careful, it's still messy AF and honestly, I might be better off wearing a mask. Now because the fur was a completely different shape than the partlet, I had to work around pretty hard to piece it correctly and hence sew the pieces together. And then I put the wrong sides together and just stitched the edge of the fur over to the wool layer. Now at this point we left for our winter holiday and I was continuing my sewing there. 
And it was also around that time that I realized I ruined it all and I cut basically two identical pieces of fur. Uh, which meant I wasted the last piece of fur that I had, which also meant I had to sew together all the leftover pieces so I could cut a mirrored piece instead. Which was honestly super fun. Love that stuff, you know. I then sewed the pieces together and the fur edges to the wool layer and thus the partlet was almost done. I'm not super happy with the back piece, uh, which is missing a seam and it's kind of odd and it gives me a hunchback, but I also dread the idea of meddling with the fake fur again for now, so I'm just gonna leave it. I did end up sewing a suede or velvet tape on the partlet though to add a little bit more spice and I think it looks nice. So all that was left was to take apart a hat that I made for my 1590s outfit. A hat that, let's face it, was a controversial shape anyway, so uh, I didn't really... I wasn't sorry. <laughs> That was almost it. Time for the reveal. Mm. So overall, um, fun, fun, fun things, fun times. Uh, honestly, 
I think the coolest part of doing anything that is pre 18th century is how much research you have to put in and how it's all like trying to figure out how they did stuff and why they did stuff and zooming in as much as possible and I think it's really cool how it allows you sort of to interpret things your own way even though there's probably like the legit way to do it but also nobody has any proof so it's a lot different to let's say making an 18th century gown that everyone knows how to do and we've all seen like the construction pictures and we all know how it was made versus sort of winging it and trying to do your best and I think it's really fun I was really lucky with the snow as well and the winter it's all mm, chef's kiss so sadly I didn't manage to renovate the skates on time and they're missing the leather straps that attach the skates to your shoe now because I didn't have that I used linen strips which were obviously soft and were not doing their job at all and it was really difficult to even stand up on those skates let alone to attempt skating so I did not do that and a future project perhaps I don't know anyway thanks for watching and um bye hope you liked it <laughs> oh my god I'm so cringy